Um, a, a lot of uh, younger people that have recently been in seminary or undergrad and met you for the first time uh, did so in a process of theological education where the most defining event for them is 9-11. And um, I, I happened when I was a sophomore in college, and I remember going to class that day where we didn't do anything, and I ran into my theology professor, and I said, this changes everything. And he said, the Holocaust did the same thing. Y'all should read Moltmann, because he figured out what's it like to let that experience shape real Christian theology in response to a world that's different because of an event. And a lot of us haven't had a chance to be a minister where 9-11 isn't a shaping part of the life of American Christianity. We're still engaged in wars that came out of it. Um, a lot of people in our congregation still have anxiety and fear that are driven by it. Uh, what advice can you give us um, in thinking through the gospel and articulating it in a way that uh, we're in a culture that's still defined by a real um, framing experience? Well, I was very much moved by Elie Wiesel's book, Night, his experiences in the concentration camp of Auschwitz when uh, he tells the episode that three uh, prisoners were hanged and two died with a cry for freedom. And uh, then there was hanging a boy who was tortured because he was so light and uh, couldn't die. And uh, then he heard a voice behind him, where is God? Where is God? And a voice answered in himself. He said, where is God? He is hanging there on the gallows. Uh, and uh, this is uh, for me a key to understand uh, the crucified God, the God who shares the wounds and uh, the pains of the victims of violence and terrorism, etc. So, and therefore I said, well, God was not absent in Auschwitz. God suffered between those who suffered in Auschwitz. And uh, this would be my recommendation to uh, the victims of 9-11 and their families. Uh, God is the fellow sufferer between them. Uh, what uh, the terrorists did, they did against God. And God is suffering under it. Um, and this gives me at least some consolation. Uh, so. God is not punishing New York homosexuals by 9-11, as somebody said at that time. I think this God who uses terrorists to punish his own people is a monster. That is, for me, not a God. But. Uh, I think we, we should uh, turn around our thinking of the omnipotence of God. God is not in control of everything. God is carrying and bearing everything. Uh, th th this is uh, his real power. Uh, his almighty power uh, was suffered by Pharaoh's army when they were destroyed. But uh, there are at least three or four phrases. Uh, you carries, carried us like a mother is carrying her child in her arms. You are bearing us through the desert like a father is bearing his own only son. And uh, we are carried on eagles' wings. Uh, so, in, again, in the prophet Isaiah, you have the phrase, I will carry you until you become old. And uh, so this patience of God, this carrying everything, gives his world time. 
and, uh, and a chance and a future. And uh, this is for me the omnipotence of God. His all patience. When, when uh, is there, was there a moment, so divine impassibility is this idea that you argue is, was inherited by the early church from Hellenistic philosophy, that the, yeah, the noose, yeah. the mind of God is, would not change because that would be in contradiction to the very character of God. And so they then develop a very strict dual nature of Christ doctrine in order to protect the impassable noose, the, the, this mind, this Greco, I mean, this Hellenistic mind of God. Yeah. When do, is there, a, is there a epiphany moment in your theological career when you kind of think that's, that's not God? Because you go on then to write, an impassable God is not a God but a demon. Only a suffering God is really God, which is a, you know, that's a strong statement. And yes, I know. Against something. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes I cannot avoid strong statements. Yeah, good. I mean, I but, really uh, appreciate that. Uh, well, this comes from Aristotle, Metaphysics, Book 12, where he says the divine is apathetic. Uh, and this is a criticism over against. Uh, the many God stories in uh, uh, the Greek mythology who are angry and uh, loving and cheating and uh, drinking and uh, the Zeus and, uh, and all the other gods uh, to, to say no, their divine nature is apathetic in itself. Uh, but the God of Israel is not apathetic he is full of pathos, of love, and of anger. Uh, and anger is a form of expression of wounded love for his people. So uh, uh, I, I think I learned this first from Abraham Heschel in his dissertation. He st still had written in Germany uh, in the 30s, and was, which was published uh, in the first form in, in uh, German. And then again in his book on the prophets, where he speaks about the pathos of God and the sympathy of God and uh, makes a lot of, out of it. Because if God is an apathetic God, then his image on earth must be apathetic too. But for us modern people, and I think for all the people on earth, apathy is an illness if a, kind, uh, a child becomes apathetic you, you go to the doctor so uh, apathy is, uh, is a sign of, of death I believe uh, perhaps there was another signal for me in the uh, when I first came to, to England uh, after uh, I came out of prison and it was in the beginning of the 60s and the new left in England had a book out with the title Out of Apathy mm. and I find this uh, very moving. That's uh, a kind of a battle cry. Get out of apathy. Get involved. Get engaged. It's better to be defeated than not to begin a fight. Get out of apathy. And uh, these two things that I brought together and uh, spoke about the passibility of God. I think uh, the first idea I got in, uh, in a conference in Scotland when I uh, ran into a book about uh, the impassibility of God and the passibility of God by uh, John Mosley, uh, a book written in 1926, where he uh, listed up the whole debate in Britain about the passibility or the impassibility of God. It, uh, a theological debate uh, which completely bypassed German theology. 
there was no one in Germany who ever heard about it. And this was a 60-year-long debate in uh, the Anglican Church between those who started from the Eucharist and then came to Golgotha and then spoke about a cross in the heart of God from the beginning on, the lamb was slaughtered from the beginning, and those who started from philosophical theology and from Aristotle. Uh, and uh, I, I picked this then up and brought it again into a, a public discussion. And how was it received by when you started? Uh, oh, it became, in the best sense of the word, controversial. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be controversial. Okay.